Thank you, Ken. Um, everybody, good morning. Um, I hope that uh, you are ready to uh, be engaged, to reflect on uh, where we are in the world at this time. We're going to be able to hear from a friend and colleague here, Dr. Jeff Braun. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Jeff, and he will uh, take you through uh, his topic, which is, has to do with the prospects for biodiversity in a time when we need more land and more energy. Um, Jeff is director of the program in ecology, evolution, and conservation biology at the university. He is an ornithologist, and uh, he has a uh, bachelor's from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, a master's from the University of Missouri, Columbia in wildlife ecology, and he did his PhD at Northern Arizona University studying zoology and ecology. Um, Jeff studies things and publishes on topics such as restoration of oak savannas and bird communities, um, West Nile virus and the high death rate of American crows. He has studied on gene flow of different species and the importance of the Chicago region and the Chicago Wilderness Initiative to avian conservation. He's reported on forest bird community structure in central Panama. So his, his exposure, his experience uh, is focused on birds, but as a conservation biologist, that means he has to figure out why trends are occurring. Uh, over the last 35 years, we've lost about 30% of the vertebrate animals alive on this earth. And uh, we are living in the midst of the sixth extinction. It's not a inevitable uh, process, however. There are opportunities for us to make a difference. So Jeff, uh, Jeff happens to have something of an ironic sense of humor and a great sense of purpose, a lot of determination. He's a finisher of his work. He's a mentor of the next generation. And I think we're all very lucky to have him and to see what he has to say today. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thanks, Val. Thanks, Bob. And uh, really pleased and honored to be invited to this event. And I even brought my wife with me because she figured the roof would fall in, considering our venue. It hasn't fallen in yet, so I guess we're okay. So, at any rate, what I want to talk about today, I'll unmute this talk. Um, the title of the talk is, What are the Prospects for Biodiversity When We Need More Land and Energy? And what I'm going to do is, to, it's a fairly local uh, case history, um, local meaning the Midwest, on what may happen with uh, markets, market forces and other land use trends that may happen in the near future given that the price of energy has gone up and what's going to happen, what the implications of that are for biodiversity and what are some things that we can do about it. And uh, I'm going to develop this having to do with tall grass prairie or the tall grass prairie ecosystem and uh, uh, associated wildlife. And the associated wildlife will focus on birds as an ornithologist, I really can't see anything else to talk about other than birds, because you know what else could there be? But um, uh, I just think birds are a good sort of indicator species, or a group of indicator species that uh, really do integrate sort of the condition of the land and uh, the biological integrity of an ecosystem, and they're uh, especially easy and interesting to study in a lot of respects. Okay, so tall grass prairie. Uh, most of you. Folks in this, and I'm sorry if we're going to stay in front of the screen, but we're kind of constrained this way. Most of you folks probably know what prairie is. And the prairie that we had in Illinois, the prairie that we had in large amounts in Illinois, was tall grass prairie with a certain number of um, uh, identifying species associated with it. There's other types of grasslands in North America, mixed, prairie, mixed grass prairie, short grass prairie to the west of us. But what we had mostly in this region was tall grass prairie. And so two, three hundred years ago, most of the state was um, featured. If you saw the landscape, you'd be staring at a lot of tall grass prairie. And that's not the case now. Um, now this map that's on, the, on your left, um, what's shown in yellow was the former distribution of tall grass prairie in Illinois at pre-European settlement. So you can see that most of the state, where it wasn't forested or where we weren't in riparian habitat or river habitat, was tall grass prairie, okay? And what's shown on the left, and I hope you can see it well, but the darker, the more worrisome, is the percent loss in tall grass prairie since, um, let's see, that says uh, 
since 1820. And because this, where tall grass prairie grows, is fundamentally great places to grow other things. We're blessed with great soil, topsoil, very, very productive. We have some of the most productive soil conditions in the world here for growing things. And market forces and society needs have led to us co-opting a lot of land for growing row crops and whatnot. And what that's led to is we've lost, in Illinois alone, about over 99% of our tall grass prairie. So this is probably a story that's familiar to most of you, but the tall grass prairie that we have remaining in the state is usually in a very fragmented condition, patches here, patches there. Um, if you've ever been involved with some of the work that David Monk does, uh, you know that it's restored in very small places whenever we can get it beside roads, beside railroads or whatnot. And so we really don't have much left, and we don't have anywhere near the extensive patches of tall grass prairie that we used to enjoy. So we've lost, a lot. there's been a fundamental change in the landscape. We've lost a lot of this habitat. But ecologists talk a lot about not just this percent loss in habitat, they also talk about change in landscape structure. We talk a lot about something called habitat fragmentation, which is loss of habitat, but also isolation of habitat. And so when you're thinking about biodiversity and you're thinking about the biodiversity that a landscape supports, um, fragmentation and landscape issues or landscape scale issues are things that ecologists talk about a lot. And I wanted to show you how we've also um, changed things at our landscapes as well, not just showing maps of percent loss, but how the structure of the landscape and the heterogeneity of the landscape has been fundamentally altered by our co-opting of the land for um, agriculture and increasingly um, urbanization and suburbanization. And to do this, um, I've uh, ripped off a couple slides from my friend Dick Warner. Some of you may know Dick Warner. And uh, Dick has done a lot of work up in Ford County looking at uh, historical changes in land use in Ford County. Now this was Ford County. This is a uh, sort of a GIS cover map in 1954, okay? And um, what is what isn't that important is sort of a key there. But you know, we did have some, there was a lot of corn, which is in red. But there was a lot of pasture, which is sort of the light green and whatnot. And this, was a, this is a fundamentally different landscape than we see now. And I'm going to show what this became. But what I, what I want to point out here, what's really important here is there's a lot of heterogeneity. There's a lot of diversity. There's a lot of pasturing. There's a lot of not just row crops, OK? Now, I'm a card-carrying capitalist. I have nothing against row crops and profits and all those things, OK? But we've really changed the agricultural system and the agricultural um, uh, markets have changed such that we don't see much of this anymore. And pasturing and, and hay and oats and whatnot, that was actually pretty good habitat for birds. This, this landscape supported pretty good avian diversity. It wasn't that different than it was in the 1700s, when we had a lot of tall grass prairies. Surprisingly, it just wasn't that different. The, a lot of bird communities or a lot of bird populations were really holding on and doing pretty well, because there was still a lot of grass in the landscape. Okay, a pasture is actually a pretty good habitat for a lot of grassland birds. But just sort of look at this, get that, sort of a gestalt of that, and this is what we have in 1990. And you can see that it's really been simplified. The landscape heterogeneity, the landscape structure here has been fundamentally altered because we have much larger uninterrupted fields now, mostly in row crops. We discovered that we can grow soybeans very efficiently, very profitably, and also corn has always been here. And so we've really changed the landscape. This type of landscape where we don't have a lot of grass, a lot of native grass, or even a lot of uh, introduced grass on the landscape has led to a real collapse in bird communities in Illinois and in the Midwest. So surprisingly, up through about the 1950s, 1960s, uh, avian populations and biodiversity associated with grassland communities was actually pretty good in the Midwest. It wasn't all that bad, OK? What really changed is when we got into these large, um, into really got into intensively row crop type um, agricultural productions. That went, that's when we started, when biodiversity really started to take a hit in the Midwest and elsewhere. 